Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, this is Mario Hardy, CEO of the Pacific Asia Travel Association. And I'm, today, I will be speaking to Margaret Effenheim, who is actually a leading author, a mentor, a former CEO of five media tech companies. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you with, uh, with us today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to have the opportunity for this conversation. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to actually start with a, a quote that I read uh, uh, on a review about your, your latest book, which is actually Uncharted, uh, which I actually find absolutely fascinating. And the quote says, ranging freely through history and from business to science, government to friendships, this refreshing book challenges us to mine our own creativity and humanity for the capacity to create the future we want and can believe in. That sounds like me. <laughs> it is. And then so one of, one of the other quotes that I actually really like and I can personally relate to it is over the last hundred years at least, we've very much fallen in love with the idea that human life is, a, is predictable. Whether it's economic models or big data or artificial intelligence, if we just have enough data, we can know everything. That was one of the founding ideas of a lot of the Silicon Valley companies. Myself and many people of my age have all been trained to think in a linear fashion. We think of the future as an extension of the past. But certainly the last couple of weeks events have actually challenged that thinking much more than we've ever had before. So I'd like you just to maybe expand on this a little bit. And, and what, were, what were you thinking when you actually um, uh, started this book? Well, I was thinking primarily that um, we seem to be surrounded by predictions. Uh, predictions, you know, this is going to be the year of virtual reality. This is going to be the year of driverless cars. Uh, this is going to be the year that, um, you know, all job hiring goes online. I mean, all, you know, it, it kind of goes on and on. They're pretty much the same. And, um, and there are also, of course, a lot of predictions about, um, you know, how many jobs will automation replace? Um, you know, what kinds of jobs will there be in the future? And the more I looked into all of these things, the more I recognized a couple of characteristics. Uh, the first was that, generally speaking, um, a large number of these so-called forecasts were coming from individuals or companies that had a deeply vested interest in the forecast. In other words, they were forecasting the stuff that they wanted to see. And um, which explained to me, I guess, why some of them were very repetitive. So the virtual reality forecast, I think is almost seasonal. It's like every autumn, yet again, we have the forecast that now finally the moment of virtual reality is gonna come into its own. And it just struck me, actually, these are not forecasts, these are just um, marketing uh, announcements. They don't have any real um, grounding in research and analysis. They're just being put out to pump up a product. And I also started to see some other things going on. So for example, the very um, notorious, I guess, or certainly famous forecast that 47% of jobs will be given over to automation by the year 2035, struck me on the face of it as being absurd. Um, for one thing, um, looking at something which was then nearly 20 years out and, and coming up with a number that was so very precise struck me as completely implausible. And then I, I downloaded the original paper where to their credit, the author, authors say in the first paragraph that they're trialing a new model. In other words, they really don't know if this is true or not. But of course, most people didn't download the original paper. And so they just looked at that and either thought fantastic automation is just about to take over the world. And if you're in an automation business, that's fantastic. Lots of other people uh, who had jobs that were going to be displaced by automation were absolutely terrified. And actually what the whole thing was primarily doing was, and, and much better forecast at doing, uh, was raising the profile of the academics who were proposing this new model. 
So I started digging into the history of forecasting and, you know, to be brief, discovered that it's always suffered from a couple of issues. You know, the forecasting industry really took off at the end of the 19th century, it, which is when it became a real hardcore business. And it has always suffered from the fact that forecasters have agendas, that is, they're things they want to see and things they don't want to see. They always suffer from a problem that the data um, that they're working from is extremely partial because you can't collect all the data in the known universe. You have to make selections and those selections are about what you think are important. So there is a highly subjective element to these things. And the other difficulty is that because it's a business, there is a great tendency to say what will please the client, will please the audience. So what this means is that many, you know, many of these forecasts have to be taken with a pinch, if not a bucket of salt, which is they are opinions masquerading as data. But actually, I'm, I'm thinking of you know, the current situation we're in uh, at the moment, or at least for the last couple of weeks, um, uh, or actually two months already, with uh, COVID-19. Do mm -hmm. you think actually that this current situation will, will force or, or speed up the implementation of some of these technologies that you're challenging, the VR and artificial intelligence and automation? Or will it have, have uh, I, no impact I at have, all? I have absolutely no idea. I mean, the truth <laughs> is that we are um, in unprecedented times in the sense that every epidemic is unique. Uh, so people who work in the field of epidemics have what is kind of um, in joke for them, I guess, which is if you've seen one pandemic, well, then you've seen one pandemic. <laughs> so there is no history to go by and there is no model. Every epidemic is its own event. There is no general profile of epidemics. And so while it's generally true that epidemics in the past have, tell, have tended to accelerate pre-existing -exist, trends. It clearly doesn't accelerate all pre-existing trends because then you just have the normal world on speed. So which trends it will accelerate and which it won't seems to me to be pretty fundamentally unknowable. So for example, you know, the argument that says, well, this is going to be a whole kind of new tourism because everybody's just going to go on virtual vacations. I can see that if you make virtual reality software or hardware, that's a very appealing uh, prediction. But it seems to me utterly implausible that people are going to want forever to stay at home um, to imagine eating uh, local food from places around the world, but not actually to eat it, uh, to imagine meeting people that are actually programmed and not actual people, to imagine having a spontaneous conversation, which is actually pre-programmed. I mean, all of this strikes me as absurd. Um, so I think that in crises of the kind that we're living through, there is so much uncertainty, which is so uncomfortable, that it makes people really hungry, hungrier than ever, for forecasts which appear to provide some certainty. But I would suggest that for the most part, there is very, very little certainty in this circumstance. And it's, we do better thinking if we acknowledge that. Yeah, I certainly hope that this uh, uh, prediction or forecast that people will go totally VR and not travel is, is, isn't one of them because otherwise uh, we have no tourism industry anymore. So it'll be really bad news for everyone if, if it goes that way. But uh, I personally believe they won't because the first thing I want to do when this is all over is go out in nature. And I'm sure that uh, it's the same view from, from many other people that I know who... Yeah. We just wish to go back to nature again. You're fortunate, as you mentioned uh, to me earlier, you, you actually live in nature, which is really good yes. for you. For those of us who live in cities, we envy you very much. Yeah, but so. you see, I also 
miss the hubbub of the city. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to the moment where you and I can have this conversation in a real cafe, you know, <laughs> and where we can sit and watch the world go back, go by. And, you know, one of the things I really miss about going to cities, because I, you know, typically go into London quite frequently, is, you know, I learn a lot just by looking around me. What are people wearing? What are they talking about? What, do they, you know, what are the looks on their faces? You know, what are they buying in shops? What are the, some of the conversations that I overhear in cafes or restaurants? All of this is incredible um, information that gives me a sense of kind of what's happening in the world of a kind that newspapers can't begin to capture. So not only do I miss that, but it's very essential to me in terms of my sense of what's going on in the world. What should I be writing about? What's the mood? What do people care about? So um, I think people, of course, are going to take care of their physical health and they're going to be careful about risks. But, you know, humanity has progressed because human beings are deeply curious about what they don't know about each other, about other places. So I think the idea that we're all going to be super happy staying at home with a huge headset clamped on our heads is <laughs> frankly ridiculous. I think this is a technology in search of an application. I, I fully agree. I actually do own a headset, but I, I use it mostly for, for, gaming, for gaming and other activities. I would never actually think of using it to, to go travel somewhere, maybe to give me inspiration to travel, but certainly not as a permanent device to, to, to use uh, moving forward. Um, but you, the, the other topic you just actually mentioned, which is also interesting, is, is the, the need for, for people to have human contact. Um, and so the other discussion that our industry is having also quite significantly is what we call the MICE industry, the meeting incentive uh, uh, mm -hmm. travel. So essentially yeah. exhibition and conferences. Uh, a lot of people are saying, well, is now webinars the, 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 the future for events and we'll not mm -hmm. have any physical event anymore. And I think most of us certainly hope that that isn't the truth fully. Uh, sure, I think there'll be a trend where webinars would continue to be popular but I also believe that face-to-face uh, -face networking events are, are actually needed in, in any sector. It's just the people to make uh, this human contact that you just talked about. I, I completely agree with you. And I'm very struck because I do a lot of webinars. At, um, and they're quite good at some things and not great at others. Um, I mean, as a speaker, it's very frustrating getting no feedback. I mean, sure, I can read the chat saying, you know, this is wonderful or this is terrible. Um, but, you know, it's very difficult in the moment to get a sense of, are people really interested in this? Or should I linger on this subject a bit longer? Yeah. You don't or know, you don't have, should I you move on see, to something else? Yeah, you can't see yeah, their I mean, faces. It just, so it's what, yeah. You can't see their faces. You can't see, are they bored to tears or are they interested? You can't tell if they're, you know, wildly amused or um, angry. So it's 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 a very difficult context in which to try to do a really good job. I think also that um, I'm very struck because of having done so many lately, and how conscious people are that what they miss are the unexpected conversations. Sometimes with people they know, sometimes with people they don't which spark off ideas and, you know, make the meeting very, very much more than a downloaded conversation. Then and exactly. so while and then, webinars have their use, I think, um, I think everybody actually in doing them realizes more of what they're missing. Yeah, then the, I mean, I find that it's very distracting too. I, I joined uh, and speak in a lot of webinars as you do at the moment and watching the comments, I actually find them uh, distracting, especially if I'm the one actually speaking. Uh, but the, but oh. certainly the, the, the networking, uh, you know, meeting that person you never expected you would meet an event and, and start building, you know, business relationship or social relationship with, with individuals you meet, just uh, the odd individuals you meet that you never expected to meet before in an event. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. yeah um, absolutely. Challenging times. Um, one of the other things that you actually have also talked about in your, your book is you said the world went from complicated to complex. Yeah. Could you expand on that maybe a little bit more? 
Yes, sure. Um, so complicated. So complicated things that are complicated are linear. Um, they're predictable, and uh, they're very subject to efficiency. So, if I can use a metaphor, I think your industry will understand. When I go to an airplane to an airport to fly somewhere, um, the the whole process of checking in and checking my bag, it's complicated. Right, there are multiple different companies that are doing baggage handling and checking in and so on, but it is pretty much the same every single person, every single day. And the more efficiently it can be done, the better. Now, once I get up into the plane and up in the air, I'm not in a complicated if, uh, context anymore. I'm in a complex one because there are all sorts of things that could happen. So, you know, there might be a goose strike um, on the plane, uh, a part might fail, there might be a bug in the operating system. Because these are known to be complex, what that, which means that there are very small things like a goose strike that could have a huge impact crashing the plane. Um, because these are not predictable, you really don't know where the geese are going to go today. Planes are designed to, with more engines than they need, working off of more operating systems than they need. Now, this is specifically inefficient in the sense that it costs more. But what it means is that if one engine fails, the plane doesn't go down. And if there's a bug in one operating system, the fact that the whole plane doesn't depend on that one system means that it will keep flying. So the world, because of globalization and pervasive communications, you know, mobile technologies and the internet and so on, has proliferated complexity. There are more and more things we can't predict. So for example, a friend of mine who runs a business, who most of whose sales are done online, who overnight lost 50% of his sales due to a bad review on Amazon. This is completely unpredictable. So in this more complex environment, it's important to understand a couple of things. One, we don't know what's going to happen. There is uncertainty in the system. As a consequence of that, it's important not to think about being efficient because efficiency strips out your margin for error or surprise or adaptation. It's important to be robust, which is what airplanes are. They're, they're engineered to be robust in the face of the unexpected. So they have more of what they need. So companies at the moment, for example, that are robust in the face of the unexpected pandemic are companies, for example, that have more cash on hand than they absolutely need. They may have stronger relationships with their suppliers than it was at the time efficient to develop. So all the time they spent really getting to know their suppliers and developing relationships of trust, those are coming in very, very handy right now. Organizations that have really deep roots of trust in their community may find that more people are willing to pitch in and help them. So whereas in the past we have really allowed the idea of efficiency to dominate all business management. I would argue that in an age where there is uncertainty in the system, we have to be quite careful to manage our businesses in a way that's robust, which is even though we don't know what the shock might be, we, are, we have enough extra resources and assets to weather whatever is going to come at us. In, um, in your book, actually, you summarize this really well. You just, just in time management versus actually just in case, uh, mm -hmm. which is the description of what you just mentioned about the aircraft. The other thing is in, in an organization we've conducted over the last few weeks, a business impact survey, more specifically with a small, medium sized enterprise in travel and tourism. Uh, to understand the impact of the current situation on their business, that they had to close down their business, that they had to lay off some staff. Uh, did they have enough cash reserve? Did they have any plans? Um, and so what we actually found is that uh, for about 42% of the businesses only had cash for two to four months. 
in 38% of the cases, um, they had to do some uh, significant layoff in their business. 15% or actually had closed down their business completely. And 65% of them had no contingency plan at all, no crisis planning um, plans in, in place uh, for this current yeah. situation. So I think the, the argument of just in case becomes even stronger uh, when yeah. we go to an event like this for the future for businesses to be more robust, as you mentioned before. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. which I think is really key. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's really interesting because until, you know, until now, basically, you know, um, bankers, for example, would always say, oh, don't sit on cash. You get no return from cash, you know, invest it or, you know, use it to buy more business or, um, you know, buy more office furniture or whatever. And uh, because having money sitting in the bank, wow, that looks like a real waste of capital. You know, you should get it out into the marketplace and active. And, um, you know, and that's good advice if you think you know what's going to happen. But since people don't know what's going to happen, um, you have to make a very careful trade-off and think, okay, if something bad happened, how much cash would I need? And in the same way that the banks after the banking crisis were forced to keep larger capital reserves, I think sensible business people going forward will recognize that cash is one source. It's not the only source, but it's one source of resilience. And in an uncertain world, you need more of it than perhaps you thought before. Yeah, actually one, one of my um, other hat that I actually wear is I run a, a venture capital fund. Um, and uh, so these are questions that go through our mind on a quite frequent basis about the current and future investments and how, how much cash we actually need to retain uh, to support yeah. the existing businesses to continue to survive and expand specifically in, in situation like this. Um, yeah. So it is, it is become very critical. It also actually relates back to something an article I wrote about a year ago, which was very controversial at the time, this is obviously pre-crisis, um, which is one of the situations in tourism that we're facing specifically here in Asia, but also in other parts of the world. The, the Chinese uh, outbound travelers, the number of Chinese traveling overseas for holidays is very significant. Most countries around Asia specifically, like here in Thailand, rely very much on a Chinese tourist uh, for for uh, the tourism economy. And so the article I wrote a year ago was, was what if Chinese stopped to travel completely? Ah. And, and then we, we did, a, we published a graph, an infographic looking at, um, we, we, we publish forecasts on a yearly basis and how actually people we expand, we expect the tourism actually to grow over a period of time. But we took the Chinese out of the equation completely and put it to zero. And, a, and a, the idea behind this was meant to be provocative in a sense that we wanted countries and destinations to think about not putting all their eggs in the same basket, to right. have more, more diversification of source markets of people visiting their destinations from other countries so that if right. a situation like this or any other has happened, yeah. where suddenly one group disappeared, you don't end up actually losing half of your market or potentially even more. Yeah. So, well, that yeah. was that was obviously very intelligent. I mean, especially because there were lots, I mean, you know, obviously MERS and SARS are, if you like, kind of early warning signs. You know, the looming trade war at the time uh, with China was clearly a, a kind of um, warning sign. I mean, I think, you know, my book argues at length, you know, I think these kinds of scenarios are tremendously important to um, design and discuss. And I think the point of them should not be, did we get it right or not? I think the point should be to identify where are there opportunities which might be underweighted and where are there risks which might be overlooked. And, um, you know, I think the, the process of designing scenarios for an industry or for a business or an economy, um, it is and should be a very creative one. It should be a process where people have to sit down and stop thinking in a linear process, 
in a linear way and start looking at the whole of the ecosystem in which their business or their industry um, exists and what are all the many, many different dependencies. And what's interesting, you know, writing about the history of scenario planning is the degree to which companies can develop their own robustness by seeing where they might actually have assets that they had undervalued in the past or see exposures which they could move early to redress, which has value even whether or not that scenario comes true or not. Yeah, in, in your actually one of your TED talk, uh, you mentioned the importance of uh, scenario planning, which, uh, yeah. which obviously is very critical for any business or for any industries. Uh, mo moving forward. Uh, this is something that actually, certainly in tourism, I've not seen too many people actually do or think about before. Uh, but now yeah. actually have, have to think about it. The, the simple fact of, of uh, trying to imagine how will we travel in the next few months when borders mm. start to open or at least domestically within the countries and eventually internationally before there's a vaccine. And after there's a vaccine, how will we travel will likely also be very different. Uh, so yeah. there's a lot of work being done in our sector at the moment, trying to imagine the various scenarios of how this will be happening over the next couple of weeks and months. We are very keen to travel again, but there will be some safety and some health measures that will be required uh, before we do so. So scenario planning is really critical. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you imagine, which seems plausible, that more people will want to travel by train than plane because it's probably easier to do social distancing on train, trains. You know, you then have to start thinking about, well, what is the price impact going to be on that? And, um, you know, or are planes really going to allow social distancing, in which case what happens to the price is there? And what does that mean in terms of the kinds of people traveling and where they might go and what they might want? and what sort of goods and services they want to for reassurance. So I think, you know, I think the key thing here is that most business plan planning starts and often ends in finance. And I think this is why companies are easily blindsided because the truth is that what has an impact on a business to some degree can be reflected in numbers, but to some degree it really can't. And so you have to start thinking of a kind of holistic alternative vision for your business or your company if you're going to be able to capture both the opportunities and the risks. And I think that, you know, scenario planning grew, historically grew out of Shell where, you know, there was a sense that the finance department could not possibly capture some of the geopolitical risks of being in the energy business and so started to try to find a much more discursive, creative way of thinking about the future. And while it's you know, become quite a robust process in the energy industry, I think it's something that most companies need to do a great deal more. And there's resistance because it's difficult and because it challenges a lot of the received wisdom in a country or a company. And, uh, but of course, Challenging the received wisdom is how you can see new opportunities and it's how you can see risk. We had uh, over the last couple of days and weeks um, and a uh, situation where I smiled, but, but, but actually there, is, there are no reasons to smile about it, where people were contacting us and say, hey, do you have a, a template to deal with this situation? Is <laughs> And, and obviously there, there isn't, I mean, no, no one's ever, ever experienced something like this before. Um, and each situation is unique and each country is different and they have each their own respective challenges. Each business is at their own also. So there are actually no, no templates uh, to, to, to look at. There is no playbook to refer to. Um, and I, you know, this is why actually, as you mentioned, scenario planning is critical. Uh, move, moving forward. So um, it's all very interesting. Yep. I, yeah, please. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think the crucial thing with scenario planning is first of all, to have at least three scenarios, three or four is kind of standard. 
And the point is not to pick one, you know, to kind of pick a future, but with each one to say, okay, if this were to happen, what would we do? And what would we wish we had done beforehand? And what's really interesting, if you ask those questions of each scenario, is that it illuminates opportunities in a business um, to, to improve the robustness of that company, either in terms of the way it's dealing with cash or with uh, people or strategic partnerships or anything like that. It just illuminates where you're naked and where maybe sometimes you have more opportunities than you saw. And the, you know, what I think is so interesting, having watched many organizations gone through, going through these exercises is, A, a lot of people simply don't have the creativity. They cannot think beyond the status quo. That is a gigantic risk because it means they're likely not to be very adaptive, which is what you need. Uh, B, they tend to think that the, the scenario that they like is the one that's going to happen. That's just wishful thinking, right? Um, and they have difficulty being able to accept each one in the round. But the point is that the process of doing these things makes people highly more alert to the system that they inhabit and which parts of it they have influence over, which bits of, of it they have control over, and which bits of it they have no influence or control at all, in which case they want to keep their eyes wide open to, to kind of keep in tune with what's going on. I like to actually just change topics slightly, although it is this uh, a little bit related to it. Something else that you've mentioned in, in a different TED Talk, which we were talking about more business management. Uh, but you, you made a, you, there was a story which I actually really enjoyed the, the, about productivity in the super chicken. And so mm -hmm. I'd like for you just to share that story with, with the audience a bit more, because I, I, I thought it was actually really interesting. Right. So this was, a, um, this was a, an experiment that was done into uh, productivity at uh, Purdue University in the United States. And it was done by an evolutionary biologist uh, who worked with chickens and was very keen to understand what would make chickens more productive. So, you know, taking his, um, his, his key from Darwin, he put one kind of very normal average flock of productive chickens to one side as a control group and let those chickens do whatever it is chickens do all day long for six generations. And then he identified this, the individually most productive chickens he could find and put those into another flock, you know, what you might call a super flock of super chickens. And each generation, he selected only the most productive chickens for breeding. So after the six generations had passed, he went back to the lab and could compare the two flocks. With the average flock, what he found was that they were all doing very fine. They were healthy and plump, and they were, in fact, producing more eggs than ever. In the super flock, the situation was completely different because all but three had died. Um, they'd been killed by the rest. And what he concluded, which I think is quite profound, was the productivity of the few had suppressed the productivity of the rest. And I tell this story because it's really a story about competition. And we have been very inclined in the last 50 years to think that if we run our businesses or indeed our countries um, along in, with a competitive ethos, that that will make everybody very, very productive. And the classic example of this in business is forced ranking, a process by which you assess everybody, you put them on a bell curve, you fire the bottom five or 10%, and you garland the top five or 10% with training and promotions and all of that stuff. And what's really interesting is how many companies around the world have adopted that process in the belief that if you make everybody in the company compete, they'll all work harder and do better work. And it's a view that was um, 
formulated by GE in their leadership school and which they proselytized all over the world. So you know, thousands, maybe even millions of companies have introduced some process like this. And what's really interesting is when I was doing some work with GE, I discovered that they've actually disbanded it because they finally crunched the data and discovered that actually it didn't work. That, you know, you don't have to be a mathematical whiz kid to realize that in this system, the absolute safest place to be is in the big fat middle of the bell curve. In other words, just be deeply average. It also meant that the people at the top were often quite dysfunctional because if you and I are both at the top in this system and you ask for my help, I am going to hesitate to give it because after all, if I help you, you might go above me and then you might push me down. And why would I want to do that? So it leads to some very dysfunctional turf wars and rivalries in organizations, which you know everybody I know who works in large organizations can recognize. And I think you know the moral of the story is that actually what motivates people isn't competition, it's some intrinsic motivation, right? A desire for learning, a desire for the esteem of one's peers, a desire to, be, to do work that matters. And what really motivates people is each other. You know, whether it's a satisfied customer or a colleague you really like working with, the sense that the company as a whole is growing and everybody's benefiting from it. These are very profound, long lasting motivators in a way that the fight for survival really is not. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a story I wish more people would pay more attention to because of course, in our quest for efficiency, we've gone the other way, you know, the gig economy, make people fight for work, uh, make people feel really lucky if they get any work, keep them on a really short string. This produces no creativity at all. It creates no loyalty at all. And it means when you're in a crisis, as we are today, you absolutely cannot count on these people because if they can help you, really, why should they? I actually uh, really like that you actually shared this story because um, one of the things I have been saying to the industry since the very beginning of, of, of uh, this crisis is that we're all in this together, that it is not a time for competition. It is a time for corporations and coordinations where we all work and stand together, help each other to go this, through this crisis all together. Um, and well, I think I that's think true up to a point. I think if mm -hmm. you've treated your workforce well and you take care of them, that's true. I think the companies that you know, rank and yank their workforce. I think the companies that take on people and throw them out again, they can't depend on these people, you know, going the extra mile for them. Why should they? And, um, and the truth is, sadly, that the while we're all in a pandemic, it is a radically different experience for different kinds of people. I mean, I'm sitting at home, you're sitting at home, we're able to do our work. But um, there are many people sitting at home who can't do their work. They've been fired. They don't know if they can pay the rent. They don't know if they can afford to buy food. And boy, oh boy, do they not feel any loyalty to their employers that have just completely forgotten about them in this crisis. So I think that the, you know, all of the research shows that companies that go into a crisis with high levels of trust and social capital come out with that reinforced. But the companies that go into a crisis with no loyalty, no generosity, no trust, will come out with a workforce, what's left of it, angry, embittered, and pretty keen to move on as soon as they possibly can. Yeah, I think that you, you've, uh, you're sharing a very valid point and a very, very important one, I think, for, for everyone who's going to this, uh, difficult times at the moment. As I mentioned before, the, the tourism industry is seriously impacted 
high by this crisis. And, and uh, this is uh, something that uh, will last for quite some time in terms of recovery uh, because of travel restrictions and all the other challenges that we're facing specifically. So I think your, your last comment will actually be uh, noted by a lot of the businesses who, who are listening uh, moving forward. Um, there was one, one last quote that actually that I thought was interesting too. You, you said, contribute to your community and make connections before trouble strikes. Don't exchange business cards in a crisis. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and I was just thinking as you were speaking, you know, that your industry is one that operates with so many different partnerships. And I think key to getting back on their feet for companies will be how far can they call on those partnerships with real friendship and generosity and a desire to help each other in order to accelerate getting back to work. And I think that, you know, the companies that have high trust with some of their suppliers, you know, whether they're airlines or restaurants or hotels or whatever, these are going to be relationships that hugely accelerate getting back to work. Whereas people who come knocking on your door asking for a discount that you've never talked to before, you know, my, my sense is they're, they're going to come, you know, to, at the end of a very long queue. So the companies that have really invested in their, you know, geographical community or their um, industry community, I think will have an easier time of it, which is that, you know, people want to help people who have helped them. One reason I'm doing a lot of webinars isn't because um, I always want to do every one of them, but a lot of people in the course of my career have been really helpful to me. And when they reach out and say, can I help them connect with their clients or customers or whatever, of course I'm going to do that. You know, I may not even want to do it. It may not be very relevant to my business, but these are people who helped me and of course I'm going to help them. And equally, when companies I don't know, you know, ask me, well, then I probably will do that if I can. But the companies that have been good to me and that, you know, where we've had really rich collaborations, they're going to come top of my list. How could they not? Very good. Last, uh, I've got two, two short questions for you. Well, one might not be really short, but what, any, any last words of wisdom for, for people working in the tourism sector today? Well, I would say that um, it's a prime moment to, in a way, to help the people who have helped you. Think about who they are, you know, in your workforce, in your whole network of partnerships and reach out to them for no other reason than that you care about them and want to make sure that they're okay. Everybody will remember the people who do that. Keep in touch with them, make sure that, you know, that they're at least personally and physically all right, um, and show you care. There is, you know, it sounds very glib, but it's true. There is always the chance in a crisis to reinforce the relationships that matter to you. And there's always a chance to you know, make them much weaker than they already were. So use the time that you have to cherish the relationships that you have, customers, suppliers, partners, and um, it'll make you feel better. It'll make them feel better. And it'll put everybody in a stronger position when this finally ends. One last question. Where do you and your family want to travel when this is all over? Oh, well, I just completely adore Italy. <clears throat> and I've been learning Italian, so it's rather heartbreaking at the moment. I'm continuing my lessons, but I don't know when I'll get there. And so it feels, you know, it's hard sometimes to keep your motivation up to learn a language when you don't know if you'll, when, when you'll get there. But um, but I'm trying to keep myself focused on the idea that, well, at least when I get there, my Italian will be better. Excellent. Well, grazie mille, uh, Margaret. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure to, to speak to you today. It's a great honor. And uh, thank you so much for dedicating some of your time to us this afternoon and for sharing your insights with, uh, with our tourism industry.
again. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. And I really, really work, wish all of you and your colleagues well. Um, you know, we need you. We want you. We will be back. And, um, you know, in the meantime, we just all have to have a lot of courage and patience. So, ladies and gentlemen, this was uh, Margaret Effenard. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much. Stay safe so we can all travel again soon. Thank you.